Welcome to another episode of the PFF College Football Show. I'm your host, Max Chadwick, alongside my co-host, Dalton Wasp. we got producer Eli back there in the studio as well. Dalton, we are just about a week away from the 2024 NFL Draft. So what we're going to do in this video is go team by team and find the perfect fit for every team in the 2024 NFL Draft. It could be a first-round player. It could be a day-two player. It could even be a day-three player that you really like uh, as the fit for them. So we're going team by team, division by division in this NFL Draft. And, man, it, it was a lot of fun putting this list together, man. I think we're going to have some uh, pretty interesting fits for all 32 of these teams. Well, Max, it's just another thing we could be a 1,000% right about, right? <laughs> but, no, it, it's always fun matching up guys, especially I, I love matching up the later guys, man, the day three guys that just – you just go their system fits or there's potential or they're just for some reason they fit that certain team. And they're always the gems you're trying to find in rounds four through seven. But, no, this is – and this is a really talented list, too. There's just so much talent in this draft. I mean, I, I had – I had teams where there was three or four guys I could have yeah. put and had to narrow it down to one and find the best fit. So it, it's a whole lot of fun. And it just I, I just continue to look at the talent in this draft and the depth of talent in this draft. It's, it's, it's going to be an electric weekend next week. I cannot wait. So let's kick it off with the AFC North. So we have the Baltimore Ravens. We're going in alphabetical order here uh, for this. So the Baltimore Ravens, Dolan, who is their perfect fit in this uh, 2024 draft? So I, I keep thinking about the fact, I think it's not been said enough that the Ravens lost three offensive line starters. And I think that needs to be a priority in this draft. And I'm, I'm looking somewhere between rounds three and four. I'm going straight down to the FCS, FCS champion, South Dakota State, with this first pick. Mason McCormick, the guard out of South Dakota State. I think he's the premier pulling guard in this draft. He's so aggressive. He's, he's just nasty. He's just that guy who just brings that nasty element to your offensive line. Solid pass blocker, too, on that level. The Ravens pull their linemen on 42% of their run plays, one of the highest rates in the league. Look, he just – he when I watched him, he reminded me exactly of the guy, their starting left guard that just left to the Jets, John Simpson. Mm -hmm. He might not be the highest-graded guy in the league. He's a little high cut, but he's incredibly aggressive, and he just brings that element – in a, in a gap scheme that you want in your offense. I think Mason McCormick from South Dakota State's a perfect fit. I think at left guard, he it's possible that he starts immediately, even if he's selected in the third or fourth round. Absolutely. I think he's probably going to end up being a fourth, maybe even fifth. If you look at the consensus board right now, I believe he's 142 on the consensus board, and, and that's basically like a fourth or fifth round pick, which I don't agree with, and I think Travis Sekma very much disagrees with that too. Our lead draft analyst, I think he has him uh, as a third round prospect, which I kind of do see that, but yeah, there's a chance he, man, he falls to like the fifth round so uh we'll be probably talking about him when he does do that but uh and we'll make sure to bring him up and see where he goes also another elite twitter highlight video some guy put this together mason mccormick it's like this rock song behind him and he's just murdering dudes in the fcs it is an elite video go find it on twitter if you haven't already uh it convinced me that mason mccormick is gonna be a stud in the nfl it was that good of a video but going uh, over to the cincinnati bengals here so i'm not gonna do this one dawn and we'd be remiss if we don't let our producer eli take over for his favorite team cincinnati Bengals. so so eli who are you hoping for for the Cincinnati Bengals in the 2024 NFL Draft? So I would say hope. Uh, I still don't think it's going to happen. I would love to see him fall down the draft boards. But I have Talise Fuaga from mm -hmm. Oregon State. Um, you, Bengals need a right tackle. I mean, they still have Trent Brown, but they did not pay him a ton of money. So I don't think it is a, uh, a long-term fit or one that they think he might not even play all the games. I mean, when you look at Trent Brown's career, he's normally missed about six or seven games a year on average. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fit is just perfect. He's a right tackle and... My personal gripe with the Bengals over the past like five or six years has been they don't get athletes on the offensive line. When you look at uh, Fuaga's RAS score, he was a 9.71, which is just absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's the one thing the Bengals need to get better at the offensive line. At the For a while, it was just getting back to average. But now you need to get guys that are uh, elite. And I think he's a guy who can progress he's obviously a better run blocker than a pass blocker at this point but with those kind of tools i think he can really adapt and mold into a guy who could be a, a pro bowl right tackle for the the near future that would be awesome i'm kind of upset you didn't go johnny newton there eli for uh, he was my second pick okay was him right. or uh tavandre sweat was going to be my like later pull for uh, just a, a really good fit after the departure of gj reader uh -huh. but uh Fuaga was there for me, so I had to take him. Yeah, that makes sense. We're gonna we're gonna repeat names a couple times here, so now that we're gonna go a different uh, prospect each time. I think Noon's uh you know Fuanga might be a better fit for the Bengals, but Noon's a better fit for Cincinnati 
to get him in the uh, PFF studio. All the time. Agreed. I think that's I think that's the best way to put it. Newton's the best fit for Cincinnati. Fuonga's a better fit for the uh, the Bengals. One hundred percent. I think Fuonga. That's a great pick, man. Obviously, best run blocker in the draft, probably. And also, I think he's a better pass protector than he's given credit for. I think he's like eighty fifth percentile in terms of true pass set grade, which is crazy. So uh, he's he's really good as a pass blocker. So Dalton, you're up again here with the Cleveland Browns. Who are you gonna go with for the uh, for Cleveland here? So there's two things that stick out to me with the Browns last season that that where they graded really low. One was receiving grade, and the other was run defense grade. So mm-hmm. they traded for Jerry Judy, trying to stack up the receiving core. I'm going on the defensive side, and I think a realistic target for me, they're not picking till 54th overall in the second round. I think Junior Colson from Michigan makes a lot of sense. Browns linebackers were 27th in run defense grade last year. They signed Jordan Hicks as a fit in their defense, but that's not really a long-term fit. I believe he's 32 years old. I like Owusu Koromoa, but more so in coverage than in the run game. I think Junior Colson is arguably the most fundamentally sound run run uh, run stopping linebacker in this draft, and I think he just he would add just a quiet like fundamentally sound element that they're missing. I, I think within a year or two, he would be the starting middle linebacker in Cleveland. Yeah, I think that's a good call. I love I love JOK as well, but I think Colson will bring a different element to a linebacking course. I think that's a great call there. All right, I'm up with my team here, the Pittsburgh Steelers. This one's kind of a reach because I don't know if he's actually going to be there, but if it's a perfect fit and what I'm hoping for on draft night, this is exactly what I'm hoping for. It's actually the pick that we made in our all-eligible mock draft as well. If you want to go check it out, uh, our last video. I'm going Olu Fashionu here, the offensive tackle from Penn State who's one of the best pass protectors in this draft, and Pittsburgh needs that, man. They're, last year, they were second to last in terms of pass protection grade. I believe they're outside of the top 20 in the last four seasons in overall grade at offensive tackle. You took Broderick Jones in the first round last year. He's your starting right tackle. You take Olu Fashionu this year. will be your starting left tackle. That would give a future tackle duo to really get excited about in a position where Pittsburgh's really struggled in each of the last like four years now. They've really struggled at offensive tackle. I think Olu Fashionu, again... I think he's most likely going to be a top 15 pick and Pittsburgh's at number 20. But I've seen some mocks where Olu Fashion does drop a little bit. So maybe they trade up a little bit to get him. Um, or another guy like JC Latham might be okay with as well in the in the first round. But Olu Fashion was really like my home run dream scenario there for the Steelers. And I think there is a chance, a slight chance he's available there, but probably not uh, based off the teams that are in front of them right now. So let's go over to the AFC South now. Dawn, the uh, Houston Texans are up here. Who is the guy that you really think could uh, really help mold this team for the future? Boy, after after the free agency period, there's not a ton of holes with the Texans. But one, one thing I would like to see them get is another corner. And I think one that could be in reach with the 42nd overall pick is Ennis Rakestraw from Missouri. Texans run a lot of cover three, cover four, off coverage. They'll blitz you here and they here and there. They started to blitz a little bit more later in the season as they needed to adjust some things. But for the most part, they're a zone team, very much in the same, you know, D'Amico Ryan's in the same vein of like Robert Sala, where they kind of rush forward and sit back in their zone defenses. But I'll take Greg Straw from Missouri, an 87.7 coverage grade in cover three and four the last couple of years. Uh, Just a really good lengthy zone corner that I think is an awesome compliment to Derek Stingley. I know they signed some depth guys, even like Jeff Okuda, in uh, in free agency. But I think Reichstraw would give them a legit number two corner that fits their system. Yeah, that's a great call as well. So, yeah, I think Rick Straw, he's a guy that I, I really like for the uh, Cardinals as well because they run a lot of zone coverage and then he could use help in that secondary. And I think he's going to be a good second round pick as well. Uh, and actually, it, it kind of fits exactly where I'm doing here for the Indianapolis Colts uh, for me. I don't think they're going to go with him on draft night, even though he will be there. But, I mean, if I'm the Colts, if I'm Chris Ballard, man, I'm taking this guy easily. It's, it's Cooper DeGean from Iowa, who I think just fits Gus Bradley's defense perfectly. Last year, uh, the Colts ran zone coverage on nearly 77% of their defensive snaps. The next closest team was about 69%. So the Colts run zone coverage more than anyone else in the draft, run off coverage more than anyone else anyone else in the draft. And Cooper DeGene excels in that role with his high IQ, um, his ability to play off coverage, his athleticism. I think he'd be a perfect fit in Indianapolis who needs some more help in that secondary. Uh, and also, again, we don't subscribe to the belief that he needs to be a safety at the next level, but the Colts need some help at safety. He is capable of playing it if, if you really need him to. So I think he fits a couple needs for Indianapolis uh, if he goes there, uh, but I really like his fit as one of their starting outside corners in that zone-heavy 
off coverage heavy schemes. That's really one of the only questions I have with Cooper DeGene is he's never really played press coverage. I think he's capable of it. Don't get me wrong, but he's never really played it at Iowa. Uh, if he goes to Indianapolis, though, he'd kind of be a lot like that Iowa defense. And obviously, he was fantastic in that Iowa defense, both as a run defender and in coverage. And I think Indianapolis, uh, they're probably going to go with like a Quinion Mitchell or Terry Arnold. But I think for scheme fit wise, I don't think it's a better scheme fit than uh, Cooper DeGene going to the Colts at 15 overall. Yeah, I, I agree. The only thing, the only thing I was curious about is I, I was a little surprised you didn't go Brock Bowers there. I thought that yeah. was going to be the move, but Dejean, we've been talking about it too on the defensive side. It just makes a ton of sense. The Colts need a lot of help on the outside at corner. Um, I'm keeping the run of corners going though in the division, and, and it seems I guess everybody in the AFC South needs cornerbacks. Uh, Jacksonville. Give me Quinion Mitchell from Toledo, man. I think you could argue he's the most talented corner in the draft. Highest graded corner in the FBS each of the last two seasons. Off coverage, press coverage. I've said it before. I think he's the corner in this draft. He's not quite as lengthy, but he plays the most like Sauce Gardner. And I think he's got top five sort of potential. And to pair him with Tyson Campbell after they brought in Eric Armstead to make their defensive line better, they lost Darius Williams. They need another corner. Ronald Darby's not a long-term solution. Quinion Mitchell can be in Jacksonville. And him and Tyson Campbell, I think, very shortly would be one of the best cornerback pairs in the league. Yeah, that's a great call as well. Yeah, and I think you could see both the Colts and Jaguars go for a uh, corner in the first round of this draft. I would not be surprised with that at all. Titans here, uh, this one's going to be chalk. And I'll, I'll give another one, too, because I know this one's very chalk. But... Titans fans should be on their hands and knees praying that Joe All falls there at number seven. I think he will, but this is a—I think this is a perfect marriage of need and value in the draft at number seven overall. Joe Alt is probably the best tackle prospect since Panay Sewell, and the Titans desperately need help uh, at offensive tackle right now. So um, I, I think this is going to happen on draft night. I think he will be there at number seven. If he is, they're going to sprint this card in. But Joe Alt, man, you see that 91 pass blocking grade, 90 zone grade, 85.4 true pass set. Uh, he really is just I've, – I haven't really seen too many tackles like him – uh, who can combine both pass protection and run blocking and be elite at both. Like we talked about Olu Fashion already. We talked about Talisa Fuaga already. Fashion is an elite pass blocker. Work to do in the run game. Fuaga, uh, really good run blocker. Still some work to do as a pass blocker as well. Joe Alt is just so complete as a prospect, man, that I think he is a slam, slam dunk uh, Pro Bowl tackle that the Titans could get and in a you know, weaker draft, he'd be a slam dunk top five pick as well. Uh, I just think the Titans should be really hoping that he falls there at seven. Because I think if he doesn't go there, then it's like, if, say, like the Chargers take him or someone like that, or the Giants take him ahead of him, then the Titans could be scrambling a little bit. Then, it, it, you know, I'm not as excited if, if I'm a Titans fan, but they should really be hoping for Joe Alt. As for maybe a later pick, uh, I kind of like Braden Fisk going to them uh, in the second round. I think that'd be a good pick for them at n number 38 overall. Uh, they could use some help on the interior defensive line. I know they got Jeffrey Simmons there, but if you can get like a three tech like Braden Fisk in there uh, to fill in for TK McClendon Jr., who's currently projected to start for them right now. That would really help them as well. And I think the defense tackle is probably their second biggest need right now after offense tackle. So I kind of like the uh, Braden Fisk fit there for Tennessee there at number 38 overall in the second round. Yeah, I agree with you. They need they need serious help in the trenches. And, and the, you know, their left tackles were last in the NFL in overall grade last season. Yeah. I'm with you. But moving to the AFC East, I'm actually going to start with the Miami Dolphins. And, and this is another team I think that needs help in the trenches. You can make you can make arguments really that they need help on both sides. They lost some big free agents in in uh, free agency. Robert Hunt on the offensive side, Christian Wilkins on the defensive side. But I, I can't help but keep pairing this guy. And there's three or four teams. I think at the end of the second round, they're going to be jockeying for Christian Haynes from UConn. Right, ninety point six zone run blocking grade over the last two seasons. Max, I think he's the premier zone blocking interior lineman in this draft. I think the end of the second round. There might even be a trade-up between the Dolphins and the Packers and the 49ers. There are going to be teams angling for this guy. But I think because they lost Robert Hunt, the Dolphins need him the most. Look, we have seen, you know, they're explosive. They've got Hill. They've got Waddle. But they're they're really rolling at their best when they can run the football. Okay. And, and Christian Haynes in that outside zone scheme, there is not a better fit. If you need a guard in this draft for that scheme, than him. I, I think he should be a mid to late second round pick. And I think the Dolphins, I, I'm probably more adamant about this match than any other match on our list. They, yeah. I, I don't think they just want, they need Christian Haynes in there. He would just, he's the perfect, perfect Robert Hunt replacement. I think they have to go get him, even if it takes a trade up in the second round. 
I don't hate that at all, man. I think I think it's fantastic, and I think uh, Christian Haynes would uh, be a really good fit there in Miami. Like I said, they could use some help in the interior offensive line to lose a couple players. So uh, go to the Buffalo Bills now. Uh, obviously, they need some help at receiver. Uh, but Stephon Diggs leaving, Gabe Davis leaving as well. Um, Brian Thomas Jr. is the one I, I went here, for the wide receiver from LSU. Kind of a deep threat, and I think he really would fit with Josh Allen. And I know Brian Thomas Jr. is kind of a boomer bust player, but I think with a player like jo- with a quarterback like Josh Allen, I think he'd really, really work there. So um, 99.9 deep receiving grade last year. He had 12 deep receiving touchdowns. He also led the nation in receiving touchdowns as well. I think 17 total. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr., like I said, he, he really fits as a vertical threat in offense. So if you're not really planning on taking shots vertically, then I wouldn't take him. But with a guy like Josh Allen, who's one of the strongest arms in the league and they don't really have too many deep threats in that receiving core right now I think Brian Thomas Jr. would be probably the player that if I'm the Bills I'm probably hoping for to get at uh at number 28 overall either him or like uh Adonai Mitchell I think would be a really good fit as well but yeah I mean you got Khalil Shakir Curtis Samuel and Justin Shorter as your projected t- start starting three receivers I think you got to get one at 28 overall I think Brian Thomas Jr. is probably the best one you can hope for there at 28. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And and you you named all those other players, and there are a lot of underneath threats. Thomas would take the top off, and really, I, boy, Josh Allen throwing to Brian Thomas just yeah. feels unfair. I, I think I that, I think that's the best. That's arguably, I think, between them and Dallas, those would be the two best fits for Thomas. I'm going to stay at receiver for the New York Jets, and, and I'm not going to go at the top here. I think I think the very top of their draft is going to be either Brock Bowers or a tackle. Let me get our favorite guy in the draft here, Max. Let me get Malik Washington from Virginia. The Jets were dead last last year in slot receiving grade in the NFL. Malik Washington plays because he's five foot eight. Yeah, he plays in the slot just about eighty eight percent of the time. I think Max, he is the best pure slot receiver in this draft. We have him as wide receiver twenty on the board right now. I I honestly think I could argue him into the top 10 or 12. When you look at the wow. numbers and the analytics, only six drops his entire career. Five foot eight, but he runs a four four seven with a 42-inch vert, which makes no sense to me. That's just silly. <laughs> and he, he was honestly, other than Malik Neighbors, you look at the numbers, he he was maybe the best receiver in the country this year. Yeah. He was he's been so good. And the thing I think I've noticed watching his tape and looking at his numbers and all that. His time at Northwestern, he was not a bad football player. This no. is not a one-year wonder thing. Yeah. For, for two years before that, he was Northwestern's best receiver. Okay, And Northwestern had the lowest passing grade in the Power Five, like right around a 40 for those two years. They just were incapable of throwing the football, and he found a way to make plays anyway. Max, I, got a, I found a stat, too. So we talk with these receivers now a lot about missed tackles forced and who's the next Debo Samuel and things like that, right? On non-screen passes over the last two years, he's forced 45 missed tackles, okay? The next closest, I believe, is Jamari Thrash with 32, and then Malik Neighbors with 30. Malik Washington, I'm telling you, if he was six, if he was six or six one, I think he would be I think he'd be wide receiver four in this draft. I'm not kidding, because there's you watch him play and there's really no flaws other than you shrug your shoulders and you go, he's five foot eight. Yeah, but uh, as a football player, I he's I'll tell you what. There are years he'd be a second round pick, and he may need to be anyway. I know I know he's gotten bumped up a little bit on our board now. I think he's up to number ninety. Mm-hmm. I think he's higher than that. I think the way he plays, five foot eight is the only flaw he has. I think he could be a he might be a top fifty player in this draft. I, I believe that much in him. And the Jets needing a slot receiver so so bad. It's like the one thing more than even the tight end spot because they still have Tyler Conklin. They need a slot receiver or they need an outside receiver to get Garrett Wilson into the slot. But get it, if they got Washington, I would be I would be afraid of this Jets offense. Yeah, dude. I, he's one of my favorite players in this draft, honestly. And I'm glad that we both see eye to eye on him. And I think he's a way better player than he's given credit for. So he's number 96 on the consensus board right now. So would you hope the Jets take him at, what, 72 just to make sure they get him? Like something like that? Like a third round would, or something like I, that? I, I would I would highly think about that. Or if, if you could trade back a few spots and get some capital and still get him, I would seriously think about him that high at 72. Yeah, I, I think he's at least – a third round pick because again i i don't see any flaws in his game yeah honestly i I just he's five foot eight and he's a slot receiver and but you know what with as much as 11 personnel is the new it's just the new basic formation now so you have to have one of those guys on the field if they don't get an odunze in the first round i think washington should be squarely on their radar i think you could argue he's the single best slot receiver in this draft yeah and i feel like 
So you have the number 111 pick in the fourth round. I feel like that's probably getting dangerous because I think he's probably not going to be there. He might be a late third-round pick. So I, I agree. I think 72 is, is well worth it for a guy like Malik Washington. So I, I love that fit for the uh, for the Jets. Uh, rounding out the AFC East and going to the Patriots here, um, obviously they're probably going to take a quarterback at number three overall, whether that be Jaden Daniels, whether that be Drake May. I know we kind of see differently on that. I'm, I'm hoping they get Drake May if I'm a Patriots fan. But uh, obviously, you got to surround whoever it is with talent outside of him. Either you can go tackle in the second round or you can go receiver in the second round. I'm going to go with a receiver here uh, with Ladd McConkey, the wide receiver from Georgia, uh, because right now the Patriots receiving core is awful. Man, I, I really am. I, there's a lot of places in this draft where I'm excited to see the rookie quarterback you know, play there, like Chicago, like Caleb Williams going there. Great situation for him to walk into. Minnesota, great situation to walk into for whoever it is, most likely J.J. McCarthy. New England's the one where I'm like, man, I, I feel for whoever's walking in there, man, because it is not looking too good right now. Right now, their starting receivers are K.J. Osborne, Kendrick Bourne, and Demario Douglas with Juju Smith-Schuster at, there as well. That is not a good starting three receivers. Uh, and also your left tackle is Connor McDermott as well. So I mean, they could go off as tackle at uh, in the second round, but I just don't know if you're going to find like a starting caliber player at 34 overall. Potentially, maybe someone falls, but I think there's a better chance you find a really, really talented receiver at 34. And I think the most likely one that could fall there is Ladd McConkey. And I, I love him, man. I think he's the best route runner in the draft, probably. Um, he's way more athletic than he's given credit for. I think uh, Trevor Sikma's comp for him in the draft guy that I kind of love is Eddie Royal. Uh, so I think that'd be a great fit for New England there. Just get a guy who can get open for whoever the quarterback is going to be for them and just help out the quarterback as much as you can. Because like I said, I am, I'm a little worried for, uh, for either Jaden Daniels or – uh, Drake May, or even J.J. McCarthy if they take him, too. I'm, I'm worried for them walking in there because I do not love the situation there in New England. So to remedy that, you got to take as many receivers, offensive linemen as possible in this draft just to make it uh, a little bit better of a situation for whoever the next quarterback is. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, when you talk about they – and I think the thing with McConkey that gets forgotten, he's a vertical threat. Yep. Look, he ran, what was it, a 4-3-9? Yep. And his – I'll tell you what, he runs as good at double moves as – any receiver in this draft he is a legit double move threat he's a legit threat to the post i think that's i think that's the hidden thing there with mcconkey is the vertical ability and the, and the ability to get open deep which really new england all those guys you mentioned they don't have that right now yeah. right but moving to the nfc north to a team you just mentioned also near the top the bears look obviously it would be no, no, we're the west we're at the afc west still just oh my bad, AFC skipping West. West. I'm skipping over. I'm skipping. <laughs> I'm skipping down to the top. My bad. AFC West. We got. I, I can't forget about the division with the Super Bowl champions. Of course, yeah. Denver Bron Another team that needs a quarterback, but it's hard to kind of fit in which at the top. Um, the Denver Broncos, and and I think it's they're very hard to predict right now at the top because is it a quarterback? Is it not? So I'm going to go a little bit later. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm, I'm going to take an edge player, and I'm, I'm I think you gave me my favorite nickname in this draft for any player with this one. Give me Gabriel Murphy out of UCLA, right? D I think you mentioned on whichever show or at some point, Diet Latu. Yeah, he's Diet Latu. You're absolutely right. But look, <laughs> almost as good, a 90.8 overall grade over the last three seasons, eighth best out of any edge player in the FBS. Look, he, you're right. His play style is exactly like Latu. There's probably just a little bit less athleticism, and Latu's such a freak he can get back into coverage and, and intercept the ball. Mm. Murphy... I think he's just missing a little bit of length, so he might just have an issue with like tackling in the NFL for a bit until he gets stronger. But I think, you know, for the way the Broncos run their defense, and they've had issues on the edge to me since they traded Bradley Chubb in 2022, Murphy is just, I think, a solid, underrated guy that if they took him in the third round, he would really be a nice player off the edge for them. Absolutely, man. That's why the lots of comparison. One, they play for UCLA together, so it's it very easy to look at the two of them together. Like, oh, yeah, they look the same. Uh, and two, like I think there's length concerns with Murphy, just as there are with Latu as well. And then also the way they play, man, they're so advanced in terms of their pass rushing moves as well. I think that's why I, I saw it's like, damn, Murphy looks a lot like Latu, even him and Grayson Murphy as well, who's also I think in this draft. So um, this twin brother. So yeah, I, I really like Gabriel Murphy a lot. I think he's one of the. I, I think I actually put him down as my most slept on or my biggest sleeper at the edge position when we did our uh, our, our ranking video. But uh, I love that fit there for the Broncos. Also, they have Nick Benito there too. Is like my my 
original draft crush. I loved Nick Benito coming out of Oklahoma. Uh, and getting him and Gabriel Murphy together would be a really, really fun sleeper uh, duo they have there in Denver. All right, I got the uh, Super Bowl champs up here. Kansas City Chiefs could use some help at receiver. So I'm going to go with Adonai Mitchell, the receiver from Texas, who is starting to look like he might be wide receiver four in the draft now. I, I've seen a lot of people put him that high. Um, he might even jump Brian Thomas Jr. for that. Uh, but I think he's going to go somewhere probably in the 20s. And the Chiefs should be hoping that he falls to 32 because I think he adds a, just a different element to that receiver room. Get downfield. Um, he's a freak athlete. And I think the one thing that really concerns me with Adonai Mitchell is some of the effort concerns that you see on tape with him. Um, but I think if there's going to be a place where he can really flourish, it's with Patrick Mahomes, it's with Andy Reid, it's with Travis Kelsey. you got very good people in that locker room to really extract the most out of Adonai Mitchell. So on the field is a great fit, and also I think just getting the most out of him, uh, Kansas City would be a really, really good spot to do that. And I don't think you'll see too much of those concerns with him in Kansas City as you might with another team like that. So I think Kansas City would be a really good spot, not only for uh, Adonai Mitchell, but Adonai Mitchell would be a great player for Kansas City as well. So I, I kind of love that marriage of the two. If he's available, I don't know if he will because I feel like Buffalo will probably take him if he is there. But uh, if he gets there to, to 32, I think that'd be a home run pick for the Chiefs. I think another sneaky spot for him would be Detroit. I, I yeah. think there's more teams than you think that are going to want Mitchell's route running in the intermediate game. Look out for the Lions there, too. But I like that one. I'm going to get back in the trenches here in Vegas. And I got a team in the Raiders who still needs help on the right side of their offensive line. I know there's a lot of fans that probably want me to match them with a quarterback, but too many unpredictable things at the top. So I'm going to go with an easier one. Let's get J.C. Latham from Alabama. I was thinking about Fuaga here, but I let Eli have him to the Bengals. J.C. Latham would work too, man. Just a massive, massive right tackle that would bring all the physicality that Antonio Pierce and Luke Getze want up front. I think if you've got Colton Miller on the left side and J.C. Latham on the right side, there's not going to be too many tackle pairings better than that. As long as Latham can just get his feet under him, if we can see that he can move in the zone game a little bit, he is just uh, he could be a dominant dominant force on the right side and and you know the raiders that would be a really good foundation they could find a right guard maybe later in the draft or you know looking through free agency but to get a guy like latham or even even fuaga or even amarius mims at right tackle um, I would love to see that just to protect whoever is throwing the football next year. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be a great fit for them as well. Another uh, Alabama office tackle going to the Raiders there, but a lot better than uh, Alex Leatherwood. I will say that. A lot better than Alex Leatherwood than Jason Latham is. So uh, good fit there for the Raiders. Chargers up here. This is kind of you're, you're hoping and praying if you're a Chargers fan. And obviously some Chargers fans want to trade down. I understand that. So maybe I'll give, a, I'll give an option too for a trade down that I like for them. But you're hoping and praying as a Chargers fan that Arizona trades their number four overall pick to get uh, to whoever to get Jason McCarthy. McCarthy. That way, quarterbacks go one, two, three, four, and that way, at number five, you could take Marvin Harrison Jr. if you're the Chargers. So I think that is the best case scenario for them, who desperately need a receiver after both Keenan Allen and Mike Williams are now gone from the team. You got Quentin Johnson, you took in the first round last year, but he had a disastrous rookie season. You're hoping he could, uh, you know, be a lot better. But even if he does, even if Quentin Johnson takes a big step and all of a sudden becomes this great receiver, you still have Joshua Palmer and Darius Davis as your other two starting receivers. So you need some talent in that receiver room, man, with Justin Herbert as a quarterback. So I think Marvin Harrison Jr., once in a decade type of talent, uh, the best receiver prospect you could say since at least Jamar Chase, maybe even going back to the A.J. Green, Julio uh, Jones days. I mean, he is a truly, truly special player. Chargers be hoping that he falls there at number five, and, and someone trades up to the Cardinals at number four to get J.J. McCarthy. Uh, if the Cardinals, if the excuse me, the Chargers do trade down, I also don't hate the Malik Neighbors as well at number five. If, if Harrison goes four and the Chargers stay put at uh at five, I think he also be a great fit. But if the Chargers do trade down, um, to kind of repeat another name, I think Talisa Fuanga would be a home run pick for uh for Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh. Just fits what they want to do, man. They want to run the hell out of that football and Fuang got 11 probably if they trade with Minnesota that would be a home run fit and he also just plays right tackle for them right opposite of uh, Rashawn Slater as well so I think that'd be a great fit as well but uh, I think for the Chargers if I'm a Chargers fan I'm really hoping and praying that somebody trades up to uh to Arizona at number four that way Marvin Harrison Jr. can fall there at number five and, th and they could sp uh, scoop him up and get a uh bona fide number one receiver that they desperately need right now yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, you could argue it's the weakest receiving core in the league. But now we're going to get to the NFC North yep. and the Chicago Bears. Sorry to keep you waiting, but they won't be waiting Thursday. They're going first. They'll mm -hmm. be fine. Um, you know, looking at – obviously, I could just say, oh, Caleb Williams sent him there, and that's it. Well, we already know that's happening. That's no fun. 
there's a lot of debate about this ninth overall pick right now. Is it a receiver? Could it be an offensive lineman? Could it even, you know, could it be a defensive player, a D lineman? I, I actually, I even think Cooper DeGene is kind of a sleeper pick there as somebody who would fit their defense. But the guy I'm going with is Jared Verse out of Florida State. Um, if they took him ninth overall, I think it'd make perfect sense. I think he's a better fit for their defense even than Dallas Turner or Leatu Latu. All right. Now, he's the premier, just classic defensive end in this draft. And those are the types of guys that Matt Eberflus uses in his defense. He doesn't use stand-up guys and outside linebackers and things like that. He wants true three-point stance, wide nine defensive ends. 91.4 pass rush grade from a three-point stance over the last two years for Jared Burst. That's actually better than Layatu Latu. And in the class, it only trails Chop Robinson. So, lot, uh, sorry, Verse. I just think, look, I think the three guys at the top are incredibly close in talent when you talk about Verse and Turner and Latu. I know we like Latu the best overall, but I think as a fit for the Bears' defense, if they were going to take a defensive player at number nine, I would take Jared Verse out of Florida State. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, I, I think it would be a good fit as well. I, I'm, so you would take him over Latu uh, just for the Bears at nine then? For them, yes. If I was Atlanta, right one spot ahead of them, mm -hmm. I would take Latu. I think that fits Raheem Morris's defense. Now, Latu can do both. I won't lie to you. He can he can go down or up or whichever way. But I think Latu's versatility and his ability to stand up and even drop back in coverage fits Raheem Morris's defense better. In Eberflus's defense, he wants just wide nine classic defensive ends. Jared Verse is actually the premier player from that standpoint in this draft. They're they're very close. Like it like talent wise, it, you if you told me one or the other was better five years from now, I wouldn't be shocked. Just for the style of it though, I like Verse better for the Bears than the other two. Interesting. I actually have a buddy who lives out here in Cincinnati, Kyle, who uh big Bears fan, and he would love he, he is pleading for the Bears to take lot to at number nine but I think he also said versus would be a great fit for them as well at number nine so that'd be a, a really good fit as well all right Detroit Lions here another buddy of mine PJ who works for the Lions uh who Dalton you're very familiar with as you guys are basically the same person both being Mets and Jets fans who are very uh, depressed about both your teams but Kool-Aid McKinstry here I'm going for the Lions I think this would be a home home run pick for the Lions use some help in that secondary I know they kind of filled out the, that cornerback room already uh very well but I don't know if there are really long-term answers there. So if I'm the Lions, uh, I think that adding another corner at uh, at the end of the first round would be a really good uh, way for them to do that. And I think the Lions, you know, Aaron Glenn runs a defense that's kind of in the middle of the pack for both man and zone coverage. So they run kind of a lot of the both. And I think Kool-Aid McKinstry kind of fits that. I mean, he's a very versatile corner, high IQ, plays really well in press coverage, but can also, with his IQ, play really well in a zone defense as well. Um, and he also, I think he's the best corner in this year's draft. He's an above average athlete. He's not an elite athlete, but he has been the best corner in college football maybe for the last two years now. I think he's probably going to end up being a, a late first-round pick. And I know the Lions could also go receiver, and I would not hate that at all uh, at the end of the first round. But I also love the fit of uh, Cooley McKinstry in Aaron Glenn's defense. I think that would be a really, really fun fit for them. And adding another Alabama defensive back to that room where they're taking uh, Brian Branch last year. So I think that would be a really, really fun fit in that defense for them. I'm with you. I, I think McKinstry would be a home run pick for them. And then if you look at how they revamped their corner room, they already had Brian Branch, but now they've got Carlton Davis, mm -hmm. Amik Robertson, and then if they had Kool-Aid McKinstry, that went from a weakness to a loaded group really, yeah. really quick if you add that in there. I'm with you. I, I think McKinstry, I didn't have him as CB1, but I definitely get the argument. He's maybe the most technically sound corner in the class, and the Lions want to play a, a lot of man coverage. That's a great fit. If he falls that far, they really need to think about it. I'm – Look, we're, we're sitting on corners apparently today. I'm going to go with another one to Minnesota. Look, they hit on a, a good young corner in Makai Blackman last year. Give me another one in Renardo, yeah. uh, sorry, Renardo Green from Florida State. I got too excited about the Florida State <laughs> defense. Um, 88 man coverage grade last year. Look, he was asked to do a lot, and all those Florida State guys were asked to do a lot between the quarterback getting hurt and just constantly playing press man coverage. Renardo Green – might be the sleeper corner in this draft pass round one. He's really, really yeah. sound, really good in press. And, you know, you think about what Brian Flores wants to do. He wants a zero blitz, man. He zero blitzes more than anybody. Press man, getting after it, putting pressure on the quarterback. Renardo Green would be just a perfect, perfect fit. Now, they don't pick um, after the 23rd pick again until the fourth round. They may have to move up to get him because I think – you know what, if you took Renardo Green in the late second round, I wouldn't even blame you. I think he's that good. And I think one of the stories, I believe there was seven Florida State defenders at the Combine, 
And you're about to find out how good all these guys are with how high they get drafted. They had a top five defense in college football last year, and all that talent's coming out. Renardo Green is one of the most talented guys from that group. He absolutely is, man. And yeah, it's just another reason why it was such BS that Florida State was left out of that playoff because that defense could have competed with anyone out there, man. It's, oh, God, I'm, I'll never get over that. But, dude, Renardo Green, so I'm looking at the consensus board, and I think, I think the consensus board is a really good way to look at around, you know, where a guy's probably going to get drafted because it, it's shown before that it uh, has some really high predictive power in terms of where guys actually go in the draft. So looking at the consensus board, he's 110 on the consensus board right now, which would be a fourth round pick. So Minnesota actually is right around there. They have the number 108 overall pick. So they get Renardo Green at 108 overall in the fourth round, dude. I mean, you, again, uh, kind of break some news here on the show. But you and I will be on the draft show for day three for PFF. I think you and I will both explode if Minnesota gets him at 108 overall, man. I think that's a. I would be, I would be shocked if he's on the board when we start day three. That I I don't know where that's coming from. That makes no sense to me. That Green's outside the top hundred makes no sense to me at all. I know that's where he is right now, though. According to all the uh, all the big boards, all the mock drafts that everyone's put together right now, so. Uh, yeah, he's 110 right now. So there's a chance that he's available in the fourth round, man, when you and I are on the show. And I think that'd be, like I said, that'd be a home home run pick for Brian Flores uh, in that defense. All right, I'll round out the NFC North with the uh, Green Bay Packers, who it's always weird. You know, Trevor Sikama and uh, Connor Rogers actually make the joke all the time on NFL Stock Exchange podcasts, which is PFF's NFL Draft podcast. I think it's the best out there. Go check it out if you haven't already. Uh, but... They made. Uh, they always make the joke that Packers are so hard to predict for, man, because it's just like so many ways you can go for them in the first round. I kind of like the idea of taking Graham Barton, the offensive tackle, offensive lineman, really, from Duke, and just kind of having him as a guy that can play anywhere on the offensive line. Uh, because right now, they could use some help at tackle with Rasheed Walker, uh, their left tackle, the former Penn State tackle, um, who honestly wasn't even that great at Penn State either. So I don't love him starting as a left tackle in the NFL. But after that, uh, you got, you know, Sean Ryan at right guard, Josh Myers at center. Uh, Elton Jenkins, who I really like at left guard. But I think Graham Barnes is one of those guys that can just use help on the offensive line anywhere. And I think he's a guy who could play anywhere on the offensive line. So I think them at 25 overall, this would be a really, really good pick for them as a guy who just is so versatile on that offensive line. He could play tackle, he could play guard, and he's even he played center originally at Duke. I think that's a guy that you just want to get in your building and just could kind of fill in anywhere you need him to. I think that'd be a really valuable pick for the Packers there in the first round. Yeah, I think you said it right, too. And I think the thing with Barton, you know, watching all these offensive linemen, I think he's the only offensive lineman in this whole draft who could play all five positions. And I think that that means something. If he was your left tackle down the road, if he was your right guard, if he was your center, I think he would excel anywhere at any of the five positions. There's certain guys who could play two or three, but none of them, none of them as versatile as Barton. I think that would be a good pick just to kind of slide him in wherever they need him. But yeah, moving to the NFC South here, Max, starting with the Atlanta Falcons. All right, picking eighth overall. I'm, I'm going to die on this hill. I'm going to just take this all the way until we don't see it happen. If Romo Dunze is on the board, wow. A for the Falcons, they should take him. They should abs- – I know they need a pass rusher. I know they need a corner and a little more on defense. Build the defense later in the draft. Even if this is the only offensive player you take in this draft, I think they have to take him. I think if you have Kirk Cousins – top three offensive line, Bijan and Kyle Pitts and Drake London and Darnell Mooney. If you add Odunze into that, just one more weapon, I think they could be the best offense in the NFC. And I think I would rather have the best offense in the NFC than wait on a pass rusher to develop. Like I'm talk- And Odunze could walk in there and get 1,000 yards in that offense right yeah. now with Cousins throwing to him. I think, again, this is another one. I think for the Falcons and the Bears and the Jets, all of them, I think I need I need a third legitimate weapon. I need one more. Football's played with three receivers on the field now. You get that third guy, if you get Odunze to any of those three teams, but I think Atlanta picking first, I would do it. I would, I would if I'm the Falcons, if Odunze or Neighbors for any reason is on the board at eight, I've got to do it. I, I just have to. Because how how could you not look at that group of guys and go I, – and go that's not one of the top five if not top three offenses in football if Kirk Cousins is healthy dude I I love it 
I love it. I imagine just jump balls between him, Drake London, and Kyle Pitts, man, and then Bijan Robinson coming out of that backfield. Kirk Cousins, oh, dude, that's awesome. That's an that's an off, awesome offense. So, yeah, PFF Zach, Zach Robinson, who uh, former employee here at PFF, now the offensive coordinator for the Falcons. He's gonna have a lot of fun there, man. If he gets Roman Dunze uh, in that offense, and probably PFF Zach will be a head coach next year with how electric that Falcons offense could be. Honestly, so I love that. Uh, Panthers here, I have, and they actually don't have a first round pick because obviously traded away to the Bears when they. Uh, uh, they took Bryce Young, uh, which ended up being the number one overall pick, and I'm, they probably regret that now, trading away DJ Moore and that number one overall pick. But anyways, they're here at 33 overall, and I think at 33, they have to, have to, have to take a receiver, I think, to help out Bryce Young. And I think I, I already used Lad McConkey. That'd be another answer I would love here for the Panthers here. Um, so I'm not going to go Lad McConkey. I'll give you a different answer. I kind of like Troy Franklin in that offense too. I think he'd be a guy that would really help out Bryce Young as a kind of like a vertical threat for them. Um, very fluid player as well. Got to put on some weight. I think he's around like 180 pounds right now at six foot three. So bigger, taller receiver, great length, but not a bigger receiver. So the handling press coverage, you could tell on his tape, man, he's got to get stronger because anytime he faces press coverage, he could kind of get bumped off his spot pretty easily. But other than that, though, I think he's a really, really good player in this draft. It could be a first-round pick in the draft as well. But if he's there at 33 overall, um, him, Lad McConkey, those, those would be a couple guys that I really want that uh, Carolina to get in that receiver room. Because right now, they just they need to do something to figure out whether or not Bryce Young can be the guy for them. And they got Deontay Johnson already, and they got Adam Thielen there as well. But I think you get a guy like Troy Franklin who could start in place of uh, Jonathan Mingo. That'd be a really, really fun vertical threat for them and a bigger receiver. They don't really, they don't really have the size in that receiver room right now besides Jonathan Mingo uh, with Deontay Johnson and, and Adam Thielen. So I like Troy Franklin as kind of a guy to as a bigger th vertical threat for Bryce Young to throw to in that offense. No, I, I agree with that. And I think getting Deontay Johnson is a really underrated move. He's one of the best receivers in football in the short game. They need a guy to take the top off. Yeah. And, and I think Franklin – I think Franklin, maybe a week or two ago, I was writing down some ideal fits, and he was he was it for the Panthers for me, too. I like that a lot. The long speed, the ability to get safeties out of the box. Dave Canales is going to want to run the ball and use his RPO game and all that. I think Franklin, he may not in his rookie year be like statistically great, but I think his fit there in that offense would help the entire team a lot. I like that. Um, I got the Saints next, and I, I actually, this might have been the hardest team on the board. I think... A left tackle makes a ton of sense, but Fashionu was already taken. There's another guy that we'll get to later that you really wanted on another team. So I'm like thinking, I was kind of thinking of ideas for the Saints. And I was, I came across the stat, Max. The Saints last year were 31st, only ahead of the Panthers in yards after catch per reception. And I was thinking about, I was like, well, who could they get if they can't get one of the top three receivers? And then, you know, we've mentioned with Brock Bowers a lot, the Jets and the Colts. Yep. But if he was sitting there at 14 for the Saints, okay, they have Jawan Johnson and Taysom Hill's listed at a tight end as a tight end, but he's Taysom Hill, right? He does like all those other things and he does all the Taysom Hill stuff. He's even still playing special teams. Right. What if Brock what if Brock Best Bowers player. played in New Orleans? They need another weapon. Michael Thomas, you know, everything happened with him and now he's gone. They have Chris Olave. Kamara's not getting any younger. You've got Rashid Shahid, who's a solid deep threat. What if Bowers came in and fixed their yards after the catch problems? Because you think about Derek Carr too. A lot of his best moments in in Oakland. I don't. Did he ever? Did he make it to Vegas? I don't even remember if he actually played I in Vegas. I don't think he did. No. Uh, a lot of his. Nah, he well, did. He did. Either way, did. a lot of his yeah. best moments with the Raiders, wherever they were, was with Darren Waller, right? And and a good tight end and somebody to to check to in the intermediate parts of the field. Brock Bowers, I think, to the Saints, it might be a match that we're not talking about enough. And he would really upgrade their tight end room and allow Taysom Hill to move around even more than he already does. Dude, Brock Bowers is probably my favorite player in this draft, so I think he's a fit for any of the 32 teams in the NFL right now. But I think, yeah, the Saints there, who really need help in yards after the catch, can't get one of the top guys. I agree with you, man. That'd be a great pick for them uh, in that tight end room if they want to take him there at 14. All right, rounding out the NFC South with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Another one of my favorite players in the draft, one, another one of our favorite players in the draft is Laiatu Latu uh, from UCLA, who I think would fit that defense so well uh, when they run a 3-4 defense. They just lost Shaq Barrett as well. Um, you look at what they're starting right now. At, uh, at edge, you got Joe Tryon Showinka, and they have Yaya Diaby. And I, I liked what Diaby showed last year as a rookie, but I just think, man, you got to add more talent there. And I think Laiatu Latu 
is the best edge in this class, and if he's somehow there, who, to his credit, and and thankfully he's he's getting a lot higher on a, on a lot of other big boards right now, so he might not be there. It seems like he's going to be a top twenty pick now, which is good. Uh, so he might not be there at twenty six overall. So, but I still think if he does somehow fall there, I think that's a the slam dunk grand slam pick for the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers there at 26. Another guy who I think will be there that I also like the fit there is Chop Robinson from Penn State. I think that'd also be a really good fun fit uh, in that defense. And I think Todd Bowles could do a really good job of extracting that ceiling out of Chop Robinson, who's kind of a boomer bust player right now. But uh, I think Wyatt Tulata should be the preferred option for the Buccaneers there at 26. 96.3 PFF grade last year, highest we've ever seen by a Power 5 player. Like I said, I think that's a big need for the Buccaneers. And if he's somehow there at 26, that'd be a uh, an unbelievable pick there for Tampa Bay. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and the Bucs, they were the lowest graded team that made the playoffs last season. They, they I think, are the one team on the board that can really go best player available. Yeah. And if Latu is on the board at 26, I would guarantee you he's the best player available. So that's a great pick. NFC East now, big story as always, Dallas Cowboys, right? Sometimes the obvious is the obvious in the first round, but I'll tell you what, maybe a pick mocked in the second round more than anything else that I've seen. Uh, Jonathan Brooks from Texas to the Cowboys. They currently have a running back room of Rico Dowdle and Deuce Vaughn, and I like both of those players, but they're not horses like that, right? They're role players. Everybody and their mothers mocking Jonathan Brooks to the Cowboys for good reason, right? And to be honest, if he didn't get hurt last year, he might have won the Doak Walker Award down yeah. there at Texas. He was actually as explosive as their offense was. He was the engine of it. He was their best offensive player. And Brooks, to me, is still the top running back in this draft despite the injury. He's the back in this class that I look at the most, and I go, that guy looks like an NFL running back. Guys bounce off of him. Excellent one-cut runner. Can shake guys in the hole. I think as long as he's recovered from the ACL injury, I I'm on board with Jonathan Brooks to Dallas. I think it makes a ton of sense. I think as long as he's healthy, he can come in immediately and be the horse in the backfield that they need. Yeah, uh, that is actually like one of the most mocked picks, I think, outside of the first round that I've seen, man. And that's I think Jerry uh, Jerry Jones loves his guys from Texas because you've, you've in from that area, honestly, because you've seen there's actually a theory of, of me and my friends. It's only like only the guys that have played in AT and T Stadium before Jerry Jones loves. I think uh, Michael Parsons did that. He had an unbelievable game against Memphis in the Cotton Bowl. That was probably his best game of his career. The Cowboys took him. C.D. Lamb had an unbelievable game in the Big 12 Championship game that was played at uh, Jerry's World. The Cowboys took him as well. I think Jonathan Brooks has played in AT T Stadium before, uh, so I think that'd be another uh, that fit the narrative there for uh, for Dallas for sure. All right, I got the Giants. Here. Here. Um, this is a uh, probably a pick that's gonna happen on draft night, and also one that I really like. It's Malik Neighbors going to the Giants at uh, when they're picking at number six overall. Uh, I think he's probably the second best receiver in this class behind Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, I think he is a special mover in space, man. He was the best receiver in college football this past season. He was robbed of the Blitnikoff Award, in my opinion. Um, I think he would be a guy that would really, really be a value add for the Giants in that receiver room. He's a little repetitive for what they have. They have a lot of like slot receivers already in that offense. And he's not really a slot receiver, don't get me wrong, but he's kind of like a, a smaller-ish receiver, and they have guys like Darius Slade and Jalen Hyde and Wanda Robinson who are kind of like that already. But none like Malik Neighbors. Like he's easily the guy if he goes there to New York. So um, that's probably a pick that I would love the Giants to make. I think Roman Dunze would also be a great fit there as well. But if it's between those two, I'm taking Malik Neighbors over Roman Dunes. And I think the Giants should do the same on draft night if it's there at number six. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I know there's been a lot of whispers about quarterback, but they just need a number one weapon no yeah. matter what it is. I'll tell you. The next team I have here has a problem stopping those number one weapons, and that's the Eagles. Last year, they were in the bottom five or six in coverage grade total. And the thing that's always stood out to me, even two years ago when their defense was great, they have problems covering in the slot. And this past year, they were last in slot coverage grade by a mile. Like, mm. it wasn't even – it's it's by at least 10 points. It might even be closer to 15. It is – they just have all sorts of problems covering the slot. I'm going to get the Eagles here, the best slot corner in the draft, and Mike Samer still from Michigan. Look, in Vic Fangio's defense, running those zones, those curl flat zones in, you know, in in the slot, and just as aggressive as he is, and the ball skills and everything. I think Mike Samer still to the Eagles would make their secondary a hundred times better. Look, they re they re-sign now Chauncey Gardner Johnson after. After losing him for a year, that makes the safety position better. They've got Reed Blankenship back there. they got veterans on the outside who struggled last year but still have something in the tank. They need a slot corner in the worst way, man. And they brought back Avante Maddox, but he was there on the Super Bowl 
run, and it just wasn't it wasn't good enough. I think Sainra still in Vic Fangio's defense getting to the ball in the run and pass game would be a perfect fit. If they get the best slot corner in this draft, their defense gets a lot better. Yeah. I think that's a great that's a great pick as well. I think that's a very Eagles pick too. I think that'd be a, a pick that Harry Roseman would love to make there, uh, probably the second round of the draft. But uh, rounding out the NFC East now with the Washington Commanders. So obviously they have the number two overall pick in the draft. They're going to take a quarterback, whether that be Jane Daniels or Drake May. I know you and I disagree on who they actually should take. You think Jane Daniels? I think Drake May. So I'm going to go outside of that. I'm going to go to their next biggest need, which I think is offensive tackle. Uh, right now they're slated to start like Braden Daniels or Cornelius Cornelius. Lucas at left tackle and then Andrew Wiley probably at right tackle they need need another tackle and I think that that's probably where I'm targeting for them uh, at number 36 overall in the draft and obviously a lot of tackles will probably be off the board there at 36 but a guy who could be there um, right now he's actually number 36 on the consensus board is Jordan Morgan from Arizona who is a really good pass blocker and run blocker he actually was uh, 80 plus in both categories this past season in terms of his grades I think Jordan Morgan's a really really solid player um, and now I don't feel great about him being your day one starter at either a left tackle or a right tackle but out of all the guys who could fall to day two because I think we're gonna have a massive run of tackles in the first round I think Jordan Morgan's a guy that I'd really like to get in, in Washington's room and just another guy to protect either Jaden Daniels or Drake May, whoever they actually end up selecting number two overall in the draft. I think Jordan Morgan would be a guy that I'm really having my eye on with that number 36 overall pick in the draft uh, to protect their next quarterback. Actually, Dalton, have you, did you see the story yesterday that they actually brought in Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and J.J. McCarthy all at the same time, all had dinner together, all played top golf together. Do you think it was like a kind of like a competition between the, the three of them? Just kind of like, all right, let's see how they do top golf together and see who, like, who the real competitor is in this room. Uh, what what a method. What a method to go about it. I don't think I've ever heard of that before, but I don't hate it either. You know, I mean, get them side by side in person. I don't know if they were doing board work side by side or having football conversations, but what a way to do it. I kind of I kind of wonder what Adam Peters was thinking behind there. I'd lo- I'd, I'd love to be able to ask him that, but it's uh, either that or it's just more efficient. They only had to buy, they only had to go to dinner once instead of three times. So yeah. maybe it's just maybe it's a time efficient thing. That could be a thing too. If they're going to interview them all anyway, get them all in at once and let it rip just back to back. I love the top golf thing. I feel like that's like a, a little competition thing that like Dan Quinn and all them and Adam Peters are probably watching. They're like, how are they going to compete in top golf? Who's like the real uh, animal here? But uh, I, I saw that Dan Quinn picked up uh, Jane Daniels from the airport though, and I don't. Someone said that I don't know if this is true or not. So I'm not going to say it is true. But someone said Drake might took an Uber to uh, the facility, whereas Jake May was picked up by uh, Dan Quinn and, and Adam Peters. So maybe that's a, maybe it's a sign of who they're, who they're leaning towards on, uh, on draft night. But, yeah, very interesting story that came out uh, a couple of days ago about what the commanders were doing uh, in terms of their top 30 visits. But let's round it out, Dalton, with the uh, NFC West now. we got the Arizona Cardinals here. Who are the, Who's their dream fit, let's say, outside of Marvin Harrison Jr. right now? I'll tell you what, this is something that you and I have talked about the last couple of weeks. It's like, man, we would just really love to see that. The Cardinals need a lot of defense. They were the lowest graded defense in the NFL by a wide margin last year. I think a guy in the middle that would help them is Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Mm -hmm. from Clemson, man. He's the highest graded linebacker in this class over the last two years. He can fit the run game. He can cover. He can blitz. He can do pretty much everything. He's a little bit thin. I think he's 230 pounds-ish. Like, there's times when you get downhill and can kind of get in his face a little bit. If you get physical with him, he has some issues. But I think the game's kind of getting away from that kind of linebacker anyway. Jeremiah Trotter Jr.'s game, it it almost, man, I see shades of Levante David. And I remember there being similar complaints about David. Like, I also don't think he's quite as fast. David was freaky fast back in the day. But he can cover. He can do pretty much all of the other things outside of like kind of being average when it comes to the downhill running game. But he's got the pedigree. He's got a wicked football IQ. He can cover. I think Jeremiah Trotter Jr. in the middle for the Cardinals in this in the third or even in the second round. Honestly, you could argue him. There's probably some scouts that think he's the best linebacker in this draft. You can see just the play style, how well schooled he is. I think if they got him, that would that would significantly upgrade their defense. Yeah, I, that's actually a pick that I made. So uh, we did a all PFF analyst mock draft. For, I think 32 of us had a different team. We did a full seven rounds. We'll be dropping very soon. I had the Cardinals, actually, and I took Jeremiah Trotter Jr., I believe, in the third round because uh, I agree with you. I think that's a guy that they desperately need to get in that linebacker room. And um, if I'm a Cardinals fan, I I'm really, really would want – one of the top, I think, four linebackers in this draft. I think there's a huge, huge drop-off after that uh, with 
Peyton Wilson, Edron Cooper Jr. Colson, and, and Jeremiah Trotter Jr. being the ones I'm talking about. Uh, you could throw Cedric Gray potentially in there as well, but uh, I think th- those are the guys that Arizona needs to get one of those guys in the draft because I think they really need help at linebacker, and I think Jeremiah Trotter Jr. would be a guy I really like. He, obviously, he's undersized, about six feet tall, 228 pounds, but other than that, he has like almost everything else you want in linebacker. He's one of the smartest players, I think, in this draft, honestly, which makes sense because his dad was a Pro Bowl linebacker for the uh, Eagles for a long time as well, so uh, that makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, Los Angeles Rams I have here. Obviously, Aaron Donald, arguably the greatest defensive player of all time, I probably make that argument. Have as he's retiring now, so you need help on that interior defensive line. Kobe Turner's there, who had a great rookie year. Uh, I love that. But if you add Johnny Newton to this defense, that'd be an unstoppable duo in the middle of that defense, man. I love the uh, idea of Johnny Newton and, and Kobe Turner kind of being the heir apparent to uh, Aaron Donald there. Johnny Newton, one of my favorite players in this draft, obviously. Uh, terrific, terrific player. Not the biggest, and I think that's one of the things that is holding him back a little bit from being one of the best defensive tackle prospects we've seen in recent memory. But in terms of production, man, uh, he has been unbelievable. So since 2022, he has 102 pressures, which leads all interior defensive linemen in the country. And he has 55 run defense stops in that span as well, which also leads all FBS interior defensive linemen. So All-American in each of the last two years. Uh, he is elite tape, elite production, really good technique as well. Um, and obviously a terrific character. Uh, check out the interview with him if you haven't already. He's an awesome, awesome dude. But yeah, I think Johnny Noon would be an, a great pick for LA. And I know they could use an edge defender. I also would like that too if they take uh, an edge in the top 20, especially Latu Latu and, and LA would be awesome. But if they go to the interior defensive line and they want to replace Aaron Donald, I think Johnny Noon is the number one guy that I would look for for them. Well, he's got a personality made for LA too, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ab- absolutely that would just be electric i could just i could just see him walking around hollywood but um san francisco here and and you know you, you took an early fit from me I, I would really like to see graham barton in san francisco yeah. i think the same thing he could help him anywhere but i'm going to take another guy that we love that we've talked about since probably october as somebody who's just being criminally underrated that's javon foster mm-hmm. from missouri man look since 2021 in this class He's actually the third highest graded tackle in this class behind Joe Alton to Lisi Fuaga. He's got an 87.7 outside zone run block grade, which would fit their system perfectly, just perfectly. Look, he, you know, some people think, oh, he's got subpar athleticism, pass protection, can he do it? He never showed us at Missouri that he couldn't do it, and that's in the SEC blocking guys like James Pierce and Dallas Turner and all these guys that they have to block on a yearly basis. Look. I think Javon Foster is the sleeper tackle in this draft. I think he's a perfect scheme fit for the 49ers. He might be able to compete for the starting right tackle job right now if he acclimates himself in pass protection. If not, maybe he's a candidate for maybe two years from now, taking over at or at some whenever he decides to retire. Maybe, maybe Trent Williams will play as long as Tom Brady and still be great. But yeah. what if Javon Foster was the guy who took over down the line for Trent Williams at left tackle in San Francisco? I wouldn't hate that at all. I think whether he's a developmental guy in pass protection or an immediate starter because of his run block abilities, Javon Foster should be a valued guy in the middle rounds of this draft. And San Francisco, for the scheme fit of it all, would be – and they're another team. Christian Haynes also would be a good fit on the inside. But I think if there's a team that could get Javon Foster and develop him into something, it's it's San Francisco. Dude, the amount of zone blocking they run too, they're one of the highest rates of zone blocking in the NFL, and he's a terrific zone blocker. I think that's a home run pick as well. Yeah, the 49ers ran zone blocking last year at the sixth highest rate in the NFL. About 56% of the time they ran uh, zone blocking when they were running the ball. So I love Javon Foster too, man. And right now, look at the consensus board. He's 131 on the consensus board, which means he's a late fourth-round prospect according to all the uh, big boards and mock drafts out there. San Francisco picks at 132. So that's right one pick right behind where he's uh, slated to be right now. So if they can get him in the late fourth round, I think that's an awesome pick. For San Fran, uh, they're probably gonna go t- uh, off as a line earlier in the draft to try to get a uh, you know a more premier talent. But I think Javon Foster, I agree with you, man, should be a day two prospect. And right now he's projected as a late fourth round, early fifth round pick, and I think that's criminal right now for how good he has been. All right, rounding out this video with the Seattle Seahawks. So, admittedly. I'm not the biggest fan of this guy. I'm a lot lower on him than uh, I think the consensus is. But 
I still think it's be a good fit for Seattle in the first round if they wanted to take him. Is Troy Fatanu, the uh, offensive tackle from Washington. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. One, he's an excellent pass protector. Uh, you see right there, 88.2 pass blocking grade. He moves unbelievably, man. He's one of the best athletes in this class at offensive line, uh, in my opinion. Also, there's another reason. I think he also, like, like fit need-wise, I think it really fits for Seattle, um, who has already a, couple, a good tackle duo of um, Abraham Lucas and Charles Cross, but they can use help on the interior offensive alignment, and I do think Troy Fatano can be a starting interior offensive alignment at guard or even maybe even center in the NFL. I think he could do that, and then eventually, say, if Lucas or Cross doesn't work out, he could kick out the tackle as well. And then, of course, another, another reason why this is a great fit is that Ryan Grubb is now the offensive coordinator for the Seahawks, who was the offensive coordinator for Washington. So there's some connections there, and he obviously coached up Fatano at a, a really high level. I think that'd be another reason why I could see Seattle preferring Troy Fatano uh, in the first round at number 16 overall. So, again, I'm not the highest on him. I think he's closer to, like, the Amarius Mims, J.C. Latham tier, and probably even behind both of them, in my opinion, uh, than closer than the uh, Alt and, and Fuaga and uh, Fashano tier. I don't think he's in that tier, but I still think that this is a, a good fit for Seattle who needs help on the interior offensive of line, could potentially need help a tackle down the line, and I think Fatano could do both at a high level, and plus he's got the connection there with Ryan Grubb too. So I think it's a, a great way for uh, Seattle to uh, to fit that need in the draft. But that's what we got for our perfect team fits for every single one of the 32 NFL teams as we're just about a week away from the 2024 NFL Draft. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. we got more draft content coming as well. And then we're going to pivot right to college football right after that, Dalton. Going back, going back to being the PFF college football show, not the uh, the second PFF NFL Draft show behind NFL Soccer Exchange, of course. But for producer Eli back there in the studio, for Dalton Washman, I'm Max Chadwick, and we will see you guys next time.